Good morning, folks. A special request here <laughs> for higher chemistry, researching chemistry, which is otherwise known as practical skills. There are some calculations in here as well, but I have already covered these calculations in my other videos, so I'm not going to cover them here. Can I just run through these again, please? Remember, if you want an ad-free, advert-free experience on YouTube, install Firefox on your phone or your tablet, find an extension for Firefox called Adblock, uh, and then watch YouTube through Firefox. Never any more adverts again. Okay, these are the things that we're required to know about in terms of actually being able to do. This is SQA, page 102 to 105. Uh, research and chemistry skills, guys. Let's start with filtration and using a balance. Uh, it's not like me to be organized, but I've actually done some of these drawings before. So filtration, basically, this is for a mixture of a solid and a solution. Pour it through a filter paper. Uh, you get the dissolved uh, sol solute down here, so that's called a filtrate, and then you get your solid residue, it's called trapped in the filter paper. Take it away, dry it, and then you get your product. Using a balance, right, many people will pop an empty beaker on a scale, press the tear button, T-A-R-E, which is the zero button, and put it to zero, and then start adding their chemicals. This is wrong. What you should do is pop the beaker on, sorry, tear the, the, uh, the balance first. So number one, tear the balance. Number two, that just means zero it, by the way. Number two, put your beaker on. You get a measurement for the beaker, say, for example, 42.42 grams is the measurement of the beaker. Number three, now add the required amount of chemical to the beaker. So add the required mass of chemical to the beaker. I'm not going to go into why it's wrong here. I, I can't be bothered. Um, this is the right way to do it, trust me. Uh, so that's filtration and balance. The next sheet I've got here... Uh, the ones on the top here are how to collect gases. Now, generally speaking, the best way to collect a gas is in a gas syringe. That does basically, that works for every single gas you'll ever make. However, just in case you get the others in more of a problem-solving question, this one here is called uh, collecting the gas above water. So the gas bubbles through this tube here, it builds up in here, it pushes the water down, and you get a... Uh, measuring cylinder full of your gas. The only problem is this does not apply to gases like chlorine, for example, because chlorine dissolves really well in the water and you end up with your gas dissolved here. Sulfur dioxide as well, that's another one. Carbon dioxide, in fact. You shouldn't even collect carbon dioxide by bubbling it through water. These two are unusual, not really used very much. This would be for a high-density gas. So you could actually collect chlorine in this because chlorine is heavier than air, so the gas will fall out of here and build up slowly in your measuring cylinder. This is for collecting a gas that's lighter than air because the gas fires out of here and builds up at the top and pushes the air down. But this is the best way, basically. In every higher paper that I've ever seen, there's a question where they ask you to draw diagrams to complete an experiment. Very often, you collect a gas at the end. So there's an overlap between this, the, these types of question here. This is known as bubbling through water or bubbling through other liquid. So if you bubble a gas through something, then you have to have this sort of set up here. The heights of the pipes are super important. The first pipe here has to be below the level of the liquid that you're bubbling your gas through. And the exhaust pipe, as it were, has to be above the level of the liquid. If you get these levels wrong, then you end up blowing this liquid out here. So it's got to be these two levels there. You've also got to have the container sealed. You notice, by the way, I did not draw the line through there. As soon as you do that, you lose a mark because the, the markers regard that as being blocked. So you've got to leave a gap. Uh, this one here is for passing a gas over hot something. So this is for passing gases over something. I say something, don't worry, the something will be in the question. I'm just showing you the technique. So this is for bubbling through, this is for passing over. If it's a hot thing you've got to have in here, you can have a Bunsen below or just write heat. This is your chemical. A classic case here might be, for example, passing carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide and then that would be, say, copper oxide. 
uh, and out of here you'll get carbon dioxide and then this will slowly change into copper. Uh, the last one is for cooling gases. This can be used to cool and condense liquids. So you have got the original YouTube, that's what it was in chemistry long before it became a website. Uh, you've got a, a U-shaped tube here and it's surrounded by icy water. Your gas, your hot stuff comes in here. Something may well condense as a liquid or a solid, of course, down here. And the remainder of the gases can pass out. So this is... Oops, sorry. Do oh, There we go. Finish your diagram, see. Pretend to be a professional. So these, these techniques here for collecting gases, these techniques are for finishing off diagrams. Um... If you look through, you'll, you'll find uh, questions that always say, draw equipment to required for this setup. And that's how you do it. Uh, what was next um, on my list? I had uh, filtration balance. Oh yeah, heating stuff. The obvious answer that I've got here, heating stuff, you notice I've just written heat. That's a bit of a cop-out. Surely I should have written Bunsen burner. Well, Bunsen's can only be used where you're dealing with non-flammable chemicals. Please don't try heating alcohols with a Bunsen burner. You're going to have a big fire that way. So what can you use instead of a Bunsen burner? Well, you can use an electric heater. An electric hot plate. And that's nice and simple and safe. And you can heat anything you like with an electric hot plate. It's never going to burst into flames. Or if you want the faster version, you can use a Bunsen, but not with flammable stuff. What is next? What is next? Uh, oh yeah, entropy of combustion practical. Uh, let's have a look at this. You need to know the details of how to calculate the entropy of combustion um, of a substance. I'll put a link up the top here um, to my video on actual calculation of entropy of combustion or go and watch it yourself. But this is the actual practical equipment. You have your fuel that you're burning in here. Um, you have got a copper can. It must be copper or other high conductivity uh, material. You can't use glass. It doesn't have a good enough conduction of heat. Copper, stop, copper glass, copper can. You've got a thermometer in it. You notice the thermometer is hovering in midair. It should not be touching the container because then you measure the temperature of the container, not the temperature of the water or other liquid that you're heating up. This is a draft shield to try and keep as much heat in as possible i.e. yeah draft shield so uh, oh, sorry come back to this later there there are a there is a procedure to follow here guys you have got to weigh the fuel at the start you've got to burn some fuel and uh, the temperature will go up then you're supposed to extinguish the flame. So put the flame out. Uh, number three, you're supposed to measure the maximum temperature that you get. Oh, ha, ha, ha. I have made a noob mistake here. Should have been a zero instruction. I don't suppose you could pause the video and tell me what I should have done at the start. Ha, ha, ha. Measure maximum temperature of the water. And at this point, you're left thinking, oh no, I forgot to measure the temperature of the water at the start. That is truly a noob mistake. So temperature of the water at the start, mass of the fuel at the start. I should really rewrite these, shouldn't I? One, two, three, four. So temperature of the water, weight of the fuel, burn some fuel, then put the flame out, measure the maximum temperature the water gets to, and lastly, measure the mass of the fuel again. So weigh the fuel at the end. That tells you how much fuel uh, you actually had to burn to get... Oh my goodness. Measure the fuel at the end, yeah. That tells you how much fuel you had to burn to get a given temperature rise. And then you can use EH equals CM delta T and then scale up for one mole. Go and watch my video on the calculation. Grant. These instructions on the right are for something very, very different. These instructions on the right are for making up a standard solution. A standard solution is nothing really fancy. It's just one that you know the very precise concentration of. So, standard solution. 
of, say, salt, for example. Not very interesting, but handy. So you would make the, ma the exact mass of salt that you required uh, using the weighing by difference technique I showed you earlier on. That's what that means, by the way. Can't remember if I told you that or not. Weighing by difference. I'll do at the end. With the mass of salt you need, dissolve the salt in a small volume. That's quite important. Of deionized water. That's also quite important in a wee beaker. Then pour your solution into, I've said here, a volumetric or a standard flask. Different people call it different things. It's, this, it's the weird looking flasks that have got a big tall neck. They've got a sort of semi-round bottom on them and they've got a single line. That is a volumetric flask. Then you're supposed to rinse your beaker and your stirrer, if you used one, several times with deionized water. Again, you can't use tap water. It's got to be deionized H2O. You're supposed to top this flask up to the line. Where is the line? So this would now be filled up to the line with deionized water again. And lastly, you're supposed to put a stopper on and mix your flask well. Those are the six stages to making a standard solution. They love to ask some of these questions. I'm not sure why. Um, what is next on my list of things to do? Oh, before we leave this, before we leave this, volumetric gear. You are expected to know that the most accurate piece of equipment in the chemistry lab for measuring volumes is a pipette. They are the daddy. They can measure like 20.01. So it goes to a tenth, uh, sorry, a hundredth of a milliliter. So if you want 20.0 uh, centimeters cubed, then that's what you want to use for it. They're the absolute best for that. Next down is a burette. They are also very good. I feel I spell, might spell that wrong. They are not as accurate as this, but they have the advantage that they could measure out something like 45 centimetres cubed. Uh, whereas these are at fixed volumes. These are 5, 10, 20, 50. This can measure 44, 47. So burette is next most accurate. Next after that is a measuring cylinder and bottom of the deck are beakers. They really suck for accuracy. So these are your two most accurate pieces of equipment if you want to measure out precise volumes. Uh, distillation is next. This is the setup for dis distillation, guys. If you have to separate, usually used to separate two liquids of different boiling points, or sometimes to purify a solution, to evaporate the water and leave behind a solid that's been dissolved in it. So heat appropriately. You know, if you're using an alcohol, don't use a flame. Thermometer stuck in there, so you can actually check that what you're getting here is what you're supposed to by its boiling point. You've got a condenser here, which are really quite cool. They are a tube wrapped around another tube, so you get a water jacket that flows around the center tube. This stays bone dry, but you get a nice cold water jacket. So this is full of vapor here, and it condenses into liquid and drops out, and that is called your distillate at the far end. And the last thing are rogue numbers. The SQA wants you to be able to spot not Rogue Squadron, Rogue Numbers instead. Now, this is SQAs. There's two different ways that I've seen them do this. Um, if you have a look at these numbers here, they all look superficially very similar, but these ones here are all within 0 0.2 of each other, plus or minus 0 0.2. This one here, I suspect, is our Rogue, so we would discard that. And similarly, you can see in this graph here, don't shout to me, by the way, if there's any real scientists out there. I know you would just do a line of best fit, but let's keep the SQA happy. That would be discarded as a rogue point. We would not include it in our graph. Even though in real life it would have to be much higher or much lower than that. And I think that's us done. Um, so, researching chemistry, otherwise known as practical skills. Don't forget, advert free YouTube. Um, I filter Oh yeah, balance. Did I mention that it was called weighing by difference? This is a... I'm rushing this video, I apologise. Uh, this process here, the correct way to measure things out, is called weighing by difference, guys. So that's what you need to do if they ever ask you to explain it. And uh, primary standards. I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of sixth year, sorry. Um, standard solutions, that's what that should have said. Standard solutions.
That's just ones of known concentration. Thank you for listening, folks. Bye-bye.